Hi, it's me again. Uh, let's talk about input transformations for sine and cosine graphs now. So the first thing we want to look at is maybe a graph that has a period change. So the graph we're going to look at is y equals sine of one third x. Now remember, in degrees, the period of a graph could be found by doing 360 divided by the B value. That's the B value. Well, we're not in degrees anymore, sorry to say. Actually, happy to say. I hate degrees. Radians are way better. So in radians, to find the period, one full trip around the circle was two, ooh, there, two pi radians. So to find the period, we're going to do two pi divided by V. So that's how you find the new period. So let's do that on this one and see how it works out. So we'll do 2 pi divided by 1 third, which is the same as 2 pi over 1 times 3 over 1, or 6 pi. So that's going to be the new period of the graph. And another way to think about this, other than as a period change, is that this is a uh, horizontal stretch of your graph. Remember when we graphed things like the square root of one third x? That took the square root graph, that's the parent, and stretched it out, made it longer. It took more x because there's a fraction inside. You need a larger original x to get the same uh, total number under your root. And that's why it ended up as a horizontal stretch. And it's going to do the same thing here. So if you know your period is 6 pi, uh, we're just going to graph one period of this function because it's a pretty big function. So if you know your period is 6 pi, just pick a number out here, pick a dot out here, label that 6 pi, maybe go in half, that would be 3 pi. Half of that would be 3 pi over 2. Notice how fun radians are, you don't have to like do any sort of fractions. I guess you could think about it as 1.5 pi, but you can also just think about it as whatever you had divided in 2. And this you can think about as uh, the distance between 3 pi and 6 pi would be something like 9 pi over 2. I found that by doing uh, the average of 3 pi and 6 pi. So 3 plus 6 is 9. Then to find the middle, you divide by 2. And that's how you got 9 pi over 2. Uh, we'll also maybe make a note over here that somewhere here would be pi. Here's 2 pi. There's 3 pi. There's 4 pi, there's 5 pi. I'm not going to need them, it's just nice to know kind of where the, the full circle is. Alright, we don't have any period changes on here, or amplitude changes, we do a period change. We don't have any amplitude changes, so we'll do just 1 to negative 1. Plot out the landmark points of the graph, using your favorite rainbow pen. And sketch a smooth curve. arrows on both ends. So that would be your graph, and because I did put that 2 pi on there, I wanted to draw in also what just regular sine x would look like. Just so you can see what, uh, how much of a transformation this was. We've really stretched this graph out by a, a pretty big factor to make it be so uh, stretchy, and that's you know, the way the stretch works. All right, uh, so let's talk about phase shift. Phase shift is a new idea to uh, Math 4, at least. I don't think you do them earlier. And the way to think about phase shift is that it is a um, horizontal shift of the graph. Um, and we don't call it horizontal shift. We have this fancy name phase shift because of a special property of sine and cosine. And I'm just going to sketch out here on the side. Um, Say I draw this wave. Now, you might think this is a sine wave, right? But I, it's not. I lied to you. This is actually a cosine wave that I have shifted over by just a couple units. So if you'll notice, the shape of these waves is really similar. Sine waves and cosine waves are actually the same shape of graph, just slightly off from each other. And so phase is an idea of like knowing where you are on the wave, 
Um, if you are an audio engineer, you work with phase a lot because you want your sounds to be in phase. So an example I like to use is that if you are listening to two speakers, boop, one from the left and one from the right, we're going to draw them kind of on the same axis. Now here's the sound wave coming from the left. Here's the sound wave coming from the right. If those sound waves meet and kind of are in the same phase, then your sound just sounds great. You're hearing both like left and right sounds and it sounds really wonderful. But say your sounds are out of phase. So I'm gonna to try to draw this here. Now when your waves meet, they're counteracting each other. You actually can't hear anything. Well, it's not that you can't hear anything. It's that it's it's very garbled. It sounds it just sounds bad. Um, this is also how your noise canceling headphones work. Is that the net you know sound here is effectively nothing, and so that's how why your your headphones have their noise canceling. Uh, so that's why we kind of specialize these phase shifts out. But we're going to treat it just like a horizontal shift. Now, eventually, we're going to do something with a period change and a phase shift. So I want to show you a method for this phase shift that might seem like overly complicated, but it's only overly complicated if you aren't going to use it later on. Uh, so because we want to use this fancy method later, I'm going to show it to you now. The idea is locating the start and end of a period. So in cosine x, uh, a period starts at x equals zero. So what I'm going to do is set the argument x minus pi over three equal to zero, because that will, if I can find the x that gives me zero, then that will tell me what's putting zero into the whole like original expression. And to find the end, uh, the period in cosine x ends at x equals 2 pi. So if I'm going to set uh, x minus pi over 3, the argument equal to 2 pi. When I solve that, that'll tell me what puts a 2 pi Ooh. into the argument. And so uh, that will tell me where the period is going to end. So I'm kind of finding just like what inputs will create the start and end of a period. I don't have to use 0 and 2 pi. I could use 2 pi and 4 pi. But I really like using zero because it's easiest number to solve with and plug in. So in this case, these are pretty easy to solve. We have here x is pi over three as a start. And here we have x is seven pi over three as our ending value. I just added pi over three to both sides. So now I'm gonna go label out my axis. I'll just pick a value. I'm gonna call that pi over three. I'm just gonna count in pi over three. So that's two pi over three, three pi over three, 4 pi over 3, 5 pi over 3, 6 pi over 3, and 7 pi over 3. You'll notice that some of these values are reduced. This is, for example, just pi. This is, for example, just 2 pi. But if you want to leave them unreduced, I'm fine with it. I think it kind of shows how you're counting. Now I kind of draw a little racetrack, or I think like a racetrack. Here's the start. Here's the end. My graph has to go in between. It goes from 1 to negative 1. So I kind of just making a box for my entire graph to live in. Uh, what are we doing? Cosine. So cosine graph starts at its highest, goes down to its lowest, and it's going to look something like this. And you could continue out the pattern if you wanted to, just to kind of show the symmetry of the graph. I do like getting it all the way back and hitting the y-intercept. Um, although it doesn't, let me be a little clear, it doesn't actually cross at zero. I think it will cross a little bit after zero. So you just want to be sure about that. Now I want to look at something specific here. Um, I already know a little bit about this graph. So when I drew the curve, I made sure I didn't cross at these markings. Um, and so it would be helpful to know where does this graph cross, because I would like to see those marked out. Well, remember that this is the middle of our graph. So then we have to find the middle 
of those two values to kind of figure out where this crosses. Well, the middle, and I've divided, the problem is here, I've divided this into three and not two. So how do I find the middle of this spot? And you can see I didn't quite cross in the exact middle. It was close enough though. Well, one way to do it is to take these values and write them as pi over sixes. So this is like four pi over six. This is like six pi over six, which means the middle value right here has to be five pi over six. So that's another one of those nice things about radians is if you have to split your axis up, like make another mark, and it's right in the middle of two marks you already have, you can just change your denominator to be uh, a little bigger, double your denominator, and then you can make those halfway marks as much as you want. Same here, I got five pi over three and six pi over three. Well, five pi over three is like 10 pi over six. So to get in the middle, that must be at uh, 11 pi over six. So those are kind of the two axis labels. I know this looks like a total mess now uh, because there's a lot of radians on there. But that is kind of the uh, what you have to do if you're doing period change or phase shift. And I did, of course, choose some values for this phase shift that would make things a little messy. Often your phase shifts, when they're by pi over twos or pi over fours, they're not as messy as this. It's really when you get into the threes and sixes that your life gets a little complicated. Hi team. Uh, let's see what happens if you have both a period change and a phase shift. Um, now, I want to apply this idea of locating the start and the end of the period for this. So to find the start, I need to set the argument equal to zero. So I'm going to say pi over four x, oh, x is over here, minus pi equals zero. I'm going to locate the end of a period. I'm going to say pi over 4 x minus pi equals 2 pi. And let's solve those out and uh, see what we get. So, pi over 4 x would have to equal pi, and then I could times by 4 and divide by pi and I get x equals four. And that's a little weird because it's just the number four. It's not four pi, it's not zero pi. It's still four radians, by the way. Uh, it just radians don't have to have a pi attached. Now let's solve the end. So, uh, so we'll have pi over four x would have to equal three pi times by four and get pi x would have to be 12 pi. So x would have to be 12. And I want to check something. I know that the distance between 4 and 12 is 8 units, right? It's 8 to go between 4 and 12. And let me check the old method of computing the period. So the period is 2 pi divided by b, which is pi over 4. Oh wait, that's... 2 pi over 1 times 4 over pi, which is, in fact, 8. So by checking 2 pi over b, you can also double check on what the period is or, or should be. Okay, uh, so let's now sketch this out. We've actually done most of the work already. I'm going to make some tick marks. Let's go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. My graph needs to go up to 1, down to minus 1. It needs to start at 4. It needs to end at 12. It needs to have its sign, so it has landmark points like so. So one kind of period of the graph will look a little better than that will look something like this. And since I've gotten these points all the way out here, I noticed that uh, it looks like if I continue this graph on out, it would continue off in this way, uh, off to the back. And that's your graph. Now, you'll also notice that this graph could also have been expressed like as maybe a reflection of a sine graph. So we did a phase shift and a period change. Uh, but this also kind of looks like negative sine of we still have to do the pi over 4x, 
because the period would still be eight, but we could have approached this graph in a different way as well uh, as, as getting the period change. So that's just something interesting uh, with sine graphs and phase shifts. Uh, I want to close with one more little graphing tip. If you notice on this the whole worksheet, I did not use graph paper. I actually don't like to use graph paper when I'm graphing sine and cosine because I think it makes the radians harder. It's a lot easier to just pick a dot and then cut it into four in, as you need instead of trying to think about how your squares should be done. But say you only have graph paper or say you want to make the most beautiful graph you've ever done did. Well, if you're going to do that, Here's what I'd recommend. When you go pick tw uh, two pi out, take 12 squares. Two, four, six, uh, no, that's 12. And label that as two pi. Here's why you're gonna do that. 12 has a ton of factors, right? It's got three, four, two, six, one, 12. But, uh, mostly 3, 4, 2, and 6. And 3, 4, 2, and 6 are the common radian fractions. So then if you want to do pi, you just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squares. There's pi. If you want to do pi over 2, you got that because you got 3 squares. But if you want to do pi over 3, you've also got that. And if you want to do pi over 6, you've also got that. So you can think about if you did this whole axis in pi over six is this would be like 12 pi over six. And that's why 12 squares is a really nice number of squares. Okay, so to recap, what have we done today? What have we looked at? Well, we've looked at all of the graphs. We've started with the sine and cosine parent functions. We looked at amplitude and midline changes. Those were output transformations. Then we looked at some input transformations. We looked at a period change, which you do 2 pi divided by b. We looked at the phase shift, where you can set the argument of the function equal to the start and end of a period. And we did a combination of both, where you can apply both of those methods, uh, kind of as a nice error checking, and then get your good sine and cosine graphs. So uh, I think that's going to be it. You've been watching ECMATH. I hope you've enjoyed your time. Please email me with any questions or concerns, uh, and have a good time graphing.